How's everyone doing today? Good? So who has plans to barbecue? Anybody? Yeah, a couple people? All right, I'll be over. Now, it's great to see so many fathers, men of God in the room on Father's Day, which is a great, uh, it's a great day to recognize um, really the role. We talked about honoring our father and mother last week, and uh, it's a God-given role, right? And uh, very grateful for that. Um, I'm honored to have a man in the room who, was, who raised me, helped raise me spiritually. His name's Terrence. He's right over there. He loves when I put him on a spot, and so we, we call him Big T for obvious reasons. And, um, but yeah, so I want to thank you. There, there you go. See, there you go. There you go. Yeah, but uh, I, remember, I remember as a young man, Terrence was very influential in my life, and so always grateful for that. Always grateful for that. I got some other great news too, man. I have almost all my sons here today, but my oldest son uh, recently let us know that uh, he has made me and his mother grandparents. Well, going to be grandparents, I should say, right? Not yet. So I'm going to be a grandpa. Can you believe that? That's crazy. That's crazy, which makes today Manny's first Father's Day, which is pretty cool. So son, if you're watching, happy Father's Day. First one, first one, first of many. And a dad in the room, I just want to, again, just want to recognize you. I, I, I really believe that um, God has given you that role. And even though God's given you that role, doesn't mean I agree with you all the time, right? Dads disagree, right? We don't agree on everything. Do we? No, right? I mean, there's a couple things. Few, but there's a couple, right? Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Dads? I said dads, Laura. <laughs> Some of us are just confused. Coke or Pepsi, right? I mean, we, we could disagree on that, right? What about this one? Especially in Chicago. No. Cat, ketchup on a hot dog or no ketchup on a hot dog? All right, okay. That's probably one we all agree on, except for some people. Recently, I had someone try to convince me that, that, I should, that it's okay and it's actually a good thing to get a pedicure. So, pedicure or no pedicure? Come on, man. Help me out here. What do you think, Rob? <laughs> no. No. And then last, of course, you know, White Sox are that other crummy team, right? So... There you go. There you go. Never fails. Exactly. You knew I was going to do it. What about, what about this one? What about murder? Do we agree on murder? Some things we disagree with, and that's fine. When it comes to murder, I think we're all in the same boat. Well, murder's not good. Murder's wrong. Murder's dumb. Don't do it. Right? However, when we study the Sixth Commandment carefully... And come to understand its implications, man. We find not only uh, that this commandment is, is more broken than you think. And blatantly. Blatantly. We can agree on a lot of things. We could disagree on a lot of things. But one thing that we usually agree upon is something like this. Do not murder. In fact, in all different types of cultures and ethnicities and, and even indigenous, murder is looked down upon. So that's my Father's Day message. Murder's dumb, don't do it. We can go home now. No. If only we were that simple. If only we were that simple. I wish it was. I wish we could just read these, these, this one little phrase in Exodus chapter 20 and it's like, oh yeah, exactly, I know that one, yeah. I think that's how we do read it. We read it like, yeah, that's not my problem, right? I, I'm, I'm maybe guilty of some of the other ones, but not this one. I'm not a murderer. I think we'd be surprised. So today we're going to spend some time. We're going to spend some time looking into this command in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, you're going to want to turn there. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. And here's a big idea that I'm hoping that we can land on today, that we can just kind of drive home. As you walk out this place and you go about your day celebrating Father's Day or whatever you're going to do throughout this week, that you would remember this. This is the big idea. God is the giver of life. God is the giver of life. We cherish the life given. When it comes to this command, do not murder, we're not simply talking about 
the act of taking one's life, all that, that's a big part of it. We're talking about who gives life, who has the authority over life, and why we should not take what doesn't belong to us. God is the giver of life. We cherish the life given. And so to understand why God is telling Israel this command in the book of Exodus, right, and, and, it's, and, and why it has implications for us today, we have to look deeper into these words that are found in Scripture. Sometimes one word, the use of one word, can make all the difference. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. It's real, not a lot of words here. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. There's not a lot of words here. In fact, in the original text, there's only two, two words. In the Hebrew, it's, it's lo ratzak. Sounds cool. Means basically like no kill or no, no murder. Don't murder. What kind of killing does, this, does the Bible mean See, the Hebrew language had like eight different words for killing. So the fact that God is using this one, uh, talking about this commandment, means that this word is specific. It, it's intentional. It's important. The word ratzak is never used in the legal system or military. Um, there's other Hebrew words for like the execution of a death sentence or the kind of killing that a soldier does in combat. Those are all different words. It's also, this, this word of Ratzak is not used for like hunting animals or the killing of animals, which means our maple, our maple, uh, our maple bacon donuts are, are safe this morning. Okay, you can eat them. It's all good. So what does Ratzak mean? What does it mean here? Philip Ryken, who wrote, uh, written in stone, and he wrote this to explain. He says, what the sixth commandment forbids is the unjust taking of a legally innocent life. It applies to murder in cold blood, manslaughter with passionate rage, and negligent homicide resulting from recklessness or carelessness. He says, perhaps the best translation is, you shall not kill unlawfully. You shall not kill unlawfully. So, what he's saying is that not all killing is wrong. It sounds dark, but it's true. A lot of us are going to eat some very tasty meat today. There's a way that we got that meat, right? Something had to die in order for us to eat that. And God's people have always recognized that there are certain situations that, that warrant the taking of a life. Sometimes it is necessary. In Illinois, actually, you know, if you take a concealed carry class, they'll teach you what are the legal what are your legal reasons for uh, stopping a threat, as they would say it? You can stop a threat when you have fear of imminent death, great bodily harm, permanent disfigurement, or permanent disability. It means somebody comes and attacks you, and you are scared for your life, and you can stop that threat. You are lawfully able to do so. But there's also ways that you cannot. There are reasons why you could not stop a threat or take a life. Um, someone said it, it's self-defense, not, not stuff defense. Meaning if somebody's taking your things, somebody's robbing you, right? You can't shoot somebody in the back who just stole something out of your car. You can't stop that. You can't protect stuff, but you can protect self. Self-defense. The protection of oneself or, or one's family. Another way that we've, we've killed and it's lawful is, is through when you're defending your country. We have a military that goes to war sometimes and they take a life. And in that situation, that is not murder. We understand that there will be casualties, that people will die. Of course, that war needs to be just. And unfortunately, there's a lot of unjust wars. But in a basic sense, defending your country. The last one, which is kind of like a buzz topic, is capital punishment. Capital punishment is another lawful way where we have taken someone's life. 
where the government decides if somebody is guilty of a crime enough or they will continue to do crime uh, that will hurt people, even take other people's lives. And capital punishment for a crime by a public official when administered justly is lawful. Uh, Paul tells the Romans in, um, or he tells the Romans, they were under imperial authority at the time, and he tells them that the government doesn't bear the sword in vain. Because the one who governs is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Romans chapter 13. We may not like it, right? Throughout the Bible, though, there's a lot of death sentences. There's a lot of, there was, in fact, there's a lot of reasons why you could be stoned to death. That was a real thing. Now, we, we may not like it today, but there are reasons when you take a life, but then Ratzak is the one that you don't do. So what makes it morally wrong, or what makes it lawful or unlawful? How do we know? I'm not trusting the Illinois gun control laws on what's lawful, what's not. I'm going to go to the scriptures. The answer is in the goal. Is it destruction of life or is it preservation? Destruction or preservation. See, in each of these other ones, self-defense, you're preserving your life and the lives of your loved ones from someone who's causing you harm. Same thing for a nation. You are protecting your nation. We, we don't have military to kill people. We have military to keep us safe. And if a death sentence was to be carried out, which is terrible, but the idea is that that person, unless they are stopped, would go on hurting or killing other people. It always, it always even when I read it today as a, as a grown adult, when I read how sharply sometimes people were put to death in the Old Testament, you're like, man, ooh, they must be serious. They are. I think sometimes we just take it lightly. Life is precious. Life is precious. It's about preservation of life, not taking of life. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Think about that. God made man in his own image. We've been saying that a lot lately throughout this series of the Ten Commandments. God made man in his own image. Life is precious to God. He is the giver of life, the author of life. We didn't sing the song, You Give Life, on accident. It's to help us understand we're singing truth. We're singing lyrics that resonate with the truth of who God is and why he should be praised. He is the giver of life. And he has made man in his image. So when it comes to life and death, God remains solely sovereign. Solely sovereign. And if you're taking notes this morning, here's kind of the first point. God gives, God is the one who gives life sanctity. God gives life sanctity. To take a life unlawfully is to violate God's sovereignty over life and death. And to rob him of his glory. And since he's the giver of life, since he's the author of life, then he has, it's his prerogative if he wants to take it and how any way he wants to take it. It's his prerogative. We get, we get hung up on this a lot too, especially when it comes to death, because sometimes we don't understand why. It's his prerogative to take it and to do so at his time and in his way. But there's one thing that is for sure, as you look through the pages of Scripture, is that God is definitely for life. He is definitely for life. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32, he says, For I have no pleasure in, in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 it says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, 
but that all should reach repentance. There's, there's scriptures in, in, the, in Proverbs that talks about how God knit us together in our mother's womb, that he knew us in the secret place. Like he, God, cherishes life. He is for life. He is the giver of life. So only he can take away. That's his prerogative. We live in a culture that doesn't hold the sanctity of life. In fact, I think it's current. I checked this last night. It could have changed overnight. But in Chicago already, 316 people have been killed this year. That's 43 more than 2020. And it's June I'm kind of scared for this summer. I don't know about you guys, but as you just kind of watch how things unfold with kind of the opening up of the city and everything like that, I just expect things are going to get a little rowdy. And usually when it gets rowdy, it gets bloody. It's not just Chicago that has developed this culture of death, let's call it. Let's say our entire nation is slipping into this type of culture. Culture of media violence, homicide, rape. Abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, warfare, terrorism, just to mention a few. It's not just, it's one thing to just not kill, but I don't feel like that's exactly all that God is getting to in this commandment. I believe that what is being communicated is that God is the God of life. He is creator, the giver of life, and he desires, listen, He desires that we would be those who value life and desire to protect it rather than to take it away. Next point is that we don't take life, we guard it carefully. We don't take life, we guard it carefully. There's a story in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to turn there because this is a, I like this story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Anybody know this story? And I just, I think it helps bring it home. Luke chapter 10, verses 30. We're going to be in 30 through 37. Jesus replied, and so there's there's a a, a lawyer that's asking God a question about who's his neighbor. He's trying to figure out who do I, who do I have to love? And then who I don't, who who do I don't have to love, right? And so he's trying to get technical with Jesus, and Jesus tells him in this res- in response, he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem in J- to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, so this man gets beaten, he gets robbed, and he gets left for dead, and, and if these robbers had been caught and they would have been brought to justice, they would have been, they would have been charged with breaking the sixth commandment. Even though this man didn't die, they left him there to die. And they beat him almost to death. But these these robbers weren't the only ones that were guilty of breaking the sixth commandment. There were two other well-standing citizens who broke it as well. They broke the law, not by killing, but by leaving the man to die, just as the robbers did. When they could have helped him. Goes on to say, Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Jesus used these two well respected spiritual leaders and figures as an example of lawbreakers. That would be like calling any of us out, putting us on blast for the things that we've done. They both saw the man and did nothing. Nothing. Actually, that's not true. They actually went out of their way to go pass by on the other side. just to avoid him. See, what this story shows is that sometimes all it takes to break the sixth, the sixth commandment is to do nothing at all. So 
So there's the unlawful taking of a life, but then there's also the negligence or the, the ability to watch bad things happen and do nothing. Martin Luther says this. He says, this commandment is violated not only when a person actually does evil, but also when he fails to do good to his neighbor. Or though, or though he has the opportunity, fails to prevent, protect, and save him from suffering bodily harm or injury. If you send a person away naked when you could have clothed him, you have let him freeze to death. If you see anyone suffer from hunger and do not feed him, you have let him starve. Likewise, if you see anyone condemned to death or in a similar peril and do not save him, although you know ways and means to do so, you have killed him. It will do you no good to plead that you do not contribute to his death by word or deed, for you have withheld your love from him and robbed him of the service by which his life might have been saved. Sometimes, sometimes it's just easy to do nothing. Sometimes we see the situation and our excuse is, I don't want to get involved. I'm too busy. I'd like to help, but... And you go out of your way to not make eye contact with the person or the situation. Because if you do, if they see you looking at them, then you're kind of obligated. You're kind of stuck. But if they don't see you, then you're free. Sometimes it's easy to just do nothing. We aren't to take life, but we're supposed to guard it carefully. <clears throat> which means that we're champions of life. Champions of life. We care not just about our life, but life itself. To be the hero of Jesus' story like the Good Samaritan. Let's go on reading. It says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the, to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. See, it's more, there's more to it than just not robbing somebody. The Samaritan took his time, his own time, his own animal, his own resources, for someone he didn't even know. And not just anybody, but a Jewish man. And that was like oil and, and water. They did not mix. In fact, I wonder if listening to the story, if, if it were the other way around, if it were a Samaritan man on the, on, the, on the floor, would the Jewish man have stopped? Probably not. But that's what's so amazing about this story. The Samaritan didn't give in to that. He didn't give in to that kind of ethnic hatred. He surpassed it, saw, saw someone in need, and he helped them. He helped them. He treated his enemy as he would a friend. Again, right, there's this Laura trying to figure out, well, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? Who should I be caring for? Which life? Who, how could I separate this to make my load a little bit easier? Jesus asked him, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, well, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Not only should we not take life, which doesn't belong to us, we didn't create it, we don't get to govern it. We shouldn't take it, we should be guarding it. We should be looking out for the lives of others. It's important to God. It should be important to us. But it's easier to do nothing, and it's easier to be selfish. Actually, it's, it's just kind of natural. It's natural to look out for yourself or your own interests. We've got to see the life. We've got to see that life lives it's not just about killing, it's about seeing that life lives, about caring for our neighbor, showing kindness to strangers and mercy to our enemies. 
Life is precious to God. He is the giver of life. We cherish the life that has been given. Now, maybe you've been guilty of the first two, but you know, we, it's hard to think of us as murderers, right? It's not, sometimes we're murderers not because we are slaying people in the street, adding to Chicago's death toll. But some of us in this room cut people to pieces with your words. You leave them in the secret of your house, bleeding out. Sometimes the words we say crushes the spirit of those we say that we love. When it comes to the sixth commandment, the truth is our hearts can murder in broad daylight. In broad daylight, we can murder. So easily. You may not think of it, but our hearts have murderous power. And murder isn't a random act. It isn't just a random physical act, an outward act. It begins with a place in our heart of us letting ourselves get to a place of us turning away from God, giving in to these, the anger Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 says, For out of the, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's the idea that what's inside comes out. So my external actions had, had an origin. They started inside, and I let that happen. Why? Because the life that I should have guarded, I didn't. I didn't guard my heart. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. What does that mean? It means that basically what's in the heart comes out the mouth. And someone's words can be used like a sword thrust, meaning that we can use words like a murderous weapon. A murderous weapon. I mean, it's easy to think that you're compliant with this commandment because you've never engaged in the, the physical act of murder. But some of us are setting forest fires. We are setting ablaze forest fires, and everybody in our path is a victim of this hatred, murderous crime. First John 3.15 says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This idea that the physical act, the way that Cain and Abel, right? That one brother murdered the other. That's one thing. But also when you hate your brother, Jesus says that's murder too. I have brothers. And man, have they got me angry. Brothers not a duty, right? There's some about brothers. Sisters too, but brothers. Especially little brothers. I only have little brothers, but... Right? They can do no wrong. Every time they do something wrong, I should have known better. Right? They made the mistake, but I should have known better. They can say I did anything to them. And they will be believed because I'm older. Oh, man, trust me. You can learn to hate your little brother. <laughs> right? Real easy. <laughs> As a kid growing up, you learn really quick how to be a first responder. And I don't mean a policeman or a firefighter or a paramedic. As a kid growing up in Pilsen, Man, people came at you all different ways. And one of the first ways you, need to have, you needed to learn how to be was quick with your words. Somebody said something to you, and a lot of fights start with words first, right? But somebody would say something, and you would learn to be a first responder, a quick responder. You strike hard, you strike fast. And you learn. You learn really quick that words can tear someone apart. You can make someone feel worthless. You can make them feel insignificant. You can use it as a weapon. 
And not because you are angry. A lot of times I use those words and I learned it really quick was because my mentality was, I'm going to get you first before you get me. I'm not going, I'm not going to be the one in a body bag today. If you've ever dealt with any type of bullying, you know that, that feeling like, I don't want to be there. That's not going to happen to me. And while some of my friends were killing people with guns, I learned to kill people with words. And sometimes those things, those habits that you grew up, maybe, maybe unfortunately, you, you, you learned this from your parents, right? Or those that you uh, were over you. Anytime my, any of my boys are at the dinner table and say something sarcastic, my head just kind of goes down like, dang it, that's me. I taught them that. That's me right there. And especially if it's David, because he looks just like me. I'm like, that's really me. Sarcasm is my love language, by the way. So, (laughs) See, we may all agree that murder is wrong, but it's easy to say that when you don't recognize that you're a murderer. And there are many ways to break the sixth commandment. And maybe we're guilty of all of them, if not most of them. I wonder how many times, if you were paying attention, did you see the spirit of someone being crushed right in front of you as the words were coming out of your mouth? As they got smaller and smaller and shrinked back. Intimidated by you. Because in that moment, we could have spoken life, but instead we spoke death. I don't know about you, but I've been guilty of that. We're talking about the Ten Commandments, not as this big idea that doesn't apply to us. No, this applies to us. We are the people of God as well, and these have implications for us. And when we think about a murderous heart, that's what it does. This, this, This reveals what's in me. The same way that God was speaking to his people and he was uh, reforming their identity, you could say. Does the same thing for us. But to break this law, to hate your brother, to disregard or to treat life as, as worthless, to be negligent when you could help somebody have the means to do so but do nothing, or when you take a life, makes us lawbreakers. That's what it makes us. You know, it's interesting. The Bible talks about those who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know who's on that list? Murderers. You know what that means? We got a problem. We got a big problem. I think that's why the Bible devotes scripture to words of the wise how it talks about how our tongues have the power of death and life because it, it's a serious thing. It's not a small thing. We kill so easily, so normally, so callously. And even as I was preparing this message and being convicted by the words that I'm reading, you ask the question like, man, well, And maybe you're asking this question this morning. What hope then is there for a murderer like me? And I would point us to the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus. Go ahead and invite the worship team to come back up. If the Ten Commandments are God's words to his people on how he wants us to live, then it also acts as a mirror, a mirror that gives us a clear picture of the person we are or maybe who we've become. It reveals that we are lawbreakers. This is the sixth commandment we've been walking through this each week. We hear God say, don't do this, but we go and do it anyway. That's what I'm saying. I know I should not do this, but I do it anyway. 
I know money should not be my God, but I worship it more than I worship God. I know I should not murder, that makes sense, but it's okay for me to, to disregard life. It's okay to have abortions. It's okay to do these things. I think when it comes to the sixth commandment, it reveals that there is a murder, that there is murder in our hearts. The thing is, Jesus was murdered. Think about that. He was murdered. He was beaten and tortured. And he died a sinner's death, death but he had never sinned. Never sinned. And Jesus was definitely provoked. I, sometimes I think about it. You know, you watch movies like Passion of the Christ or things like that. And, and what might have happened. And who knows. It probably is not even close to what it really was. It's probably worse. But as people, it says that they mocked him. They spit at him. Being provoked that way, especially when you're innocent, to be treated so unjust, to be treated so unfairly, to be considered nothing. And yet not once did Jesus react with anger when he could have. And he would have been just because for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he never sinned, and through this, he offered perfect obedience to the sixth commandment. When Jesus died on the cross at the hand of men, he was dying for murderers too. Murderers like me and you. We know this because Jesus says it in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, is, as all this is happening, Jesus in that moment asks God the Father to forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, what me and you can't accomplish by keeping the law perfect, we're lawbreakers. Jesus fulfills. And that fulfillment he gives to us. He did that when he died a sinner's death without sinning and raised back to life on the third day. Offering forgiveness for those who would repent. It's interesting in Acts chapter 2 verses 37 through 38, after Jesus had ascended, he had risen, ascended, Peter goes back to the same people that actually had called for Jesus' crucifixion. And he basically accused them of murder, saying, you killed the Savior, the one that came for you. You are the one that crucified him. This is what it says. Listen to how they respond when they are told that they are murderers. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The very murder that they were guilty of was the one that was bringing atonement for them. And the crucifixion, the murder of Jesus Christ can be atonement for you as well. But it starts with you identifying as the lawbreaker, with you admitting before God your brokenness, your guiltiness. Are you guilty of a murderous heart? Have you said out loud or in your thoughts things that have only meant to destroy, they weren't uplifting? Have you hated someone so much in your heart that you've committed murder in your heart? Someone who's betrayed you, someone you trusted, someone you respected that betrayed you. 
Have you had the means to help someone who was not okay and you chose negligence instead? You chose to not care for the life of a person who is made in the image of God as well. Or maybe this morning, you're weighed down this morning by the choice you made to end the life that was in your womb. No matter the method of our murder, I would say this morning there is forgiveness for a sinner who repents and turns their heart back to God. So that's what I want. This morning, I, I want to invite you as we close this service, as we talk about the sixth commandment, we talk about and we bring this into perspective of our own life, okay? There's reasons why this was written to Israel, but there's implications and reason why we're hearing it today. These words are for you because God has called us to be his people, which means that we live a certain way, which means that we talk differently. We don't speak death, we speak life. We don't take life, we cherish it. But your heart this morning is only for you to steward Your heart before the Lord this morning, and this is the time to respond. This is the time to respond. So I'm going to open up the altar as we do every week. I would love to pray with you if you want to pray. For whatever reason, whatever reason, you need to come forward maybe and do some soul care between you and the Lord. Maybe you are guilty. Maybe you want to repent. Maybe you don't know what to say. That's okay. Come. Come to a safe place where the Lord will meet you. Come and return your heart back to God. Say, God, I am sorry. I am sorry for my murderous heart, for my murderous deeds, for my negligence for life, my carelessness, maybe. And the same way that Jesus forgave the thief behind, on, beside him, the same way that he forgave the people who called for his crucifixion. There's forgiveness in Jesus this morning. So I want to invite you to stand as we close in this last song. And as they sing this song, it's a song we sang earlier, I want to invite you to the altar to come forward.